I'd like to uh, thank uh, Provost Lopes for uh, sponsoring this and for uh, making this all possible, This the lecture series. Um, uh, I'm sorry that uh, um, uh, I want to uh, 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 communicate to you um, the, the President's um, apologies for not being here. Uh, she's uh, had some family uh, issues to deal with, um, family emergency to deal with this uh, today and the next couple days. Uh, otherwise, she would be here herself. Um, but it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor uh, Francisco Gaitan. Uh, he's Associate Professor of Social Work Sociology, uh, Latino and Latin American Studies at Northeastern Illinois University. He uh, has a doctorate from NYU, uh, so he's part New Yorker. Um, uh, he has a, a, a master's degree in education from Harvard, an MSW from Berkeley, and an uh, undergraduate from Loyola, a Chicago native, and now back in Chicago. Um, he is the, um, uh, also the Provost's Fellow for Retention and Success at, um, at Northeastern Illinois. And he is the director of uh, ENLACE, the uh, Leadership Institute. Uh, it's an initiative that funds the tuition of 10 to 15 individuals for enrollment in master's degree in educational leadership with higher education concentration every two-year cohort with the aim of supporting and promising students to work as culturally competent administrators who understand how to maximize the success of first-generation college students, economically challenged students, immigrants, and students from underrepresented groups, particu particularly at urban HSIs like Northeastern and like John Jay. His research has focused on this same population and some of these same issues, social mobility through education, access to post-secondary education among Latinos, first-generation college students and immigrants, and the role of public institutions for Latinos, particularly public universities and federally designated HSIs. Um, we had a great lunch hearing uh, informally from uh, Professor Gaitan, so it's my uh, pleasure to introduce him and welcome him here to John Jay. All right, when I start this? Okay. Uh, you're bien educados. So if you were at our <laughs> talk earlier, uh, we talked a little bit about Latino culture and uh, the meaning of educación, um, which as many people know means well-mannered, but if you don't know, it means well-mannered. Um, so you're a very well-mannered audience. Uh, it's really good to be here um, back in New York City. Um, happy to uh, to be uh, what I feel like is my second home. Uh, people from Chicago don't like that. They don't like that I tell them that New York is better than Chicago, uh, but it is. <laughs> and I could say that when I'm in New York, uh, but when I say it to my students, they get very upset, um, even though I'm a native Chicagoan. So I'm, I'm happy uh, that, that you've welcomed me here. Today, uh, you know, my understanding is that you had uh, Gina Garcia already speak here. Um, and she's a colleague, a friend of mine, um, and so I'm really happy that she was able to kind of set up some of the context of what it means to be a Hispanic serving institution, and I'm hoping to talk and expand upon that a little bit more. This is a really exciting conversation that you've all uh, have put together, uh, and so I'm hoping for some engaging conversation around that. We had a really nice uh, lunchtime uh, conversation, as uh, Avi mentioned, and so if we can continue that here, that'd be fantastic. Uh, so I've titled this uh, Intentionality, Identity, and Culture at Hispanic Serving Institutions um, because uh, as I'll get into a little bit about my background coming from psychology, um, where we don't always think about culture and we don't always, don't always think about people's intentions as it relates to culture, uh, and we don't always think about institutions. Uh, but I found myself uh, caring very much about these things to, despite my training as somebody who studies individual human behavior, who has, who's trained to study uh, in, individual uh, you know, identity, individual uh, education, uh, things of that sort. Um, so it's been over the process of years that I've evolved, I, I would say my own identity has evolved even as an academic, and, and part of this even represents a little bit of that journey. So, uh, so without further ado, we'll just go ahead. Um, so because it, 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 it it relates to who I am as an individual. Uh, I have a friend who calls this type of research me search, right? It's it's about me, um, my favorite topic. Um, you know, it's uh, you know, this really has been I have found an exploration of my own journey uh, as uh, the child of Mexican immigrants, of my own journey as a first generation college student, 
of my own journey as a person who attended uh, a public university and uh, didn't do so well. University of Illinois, Chicago, um, I, I, I attended for my first semester. Uh, I love to tell my students, and they love this story. Uh, I got straight Fs my first uh, semester of college, uh, so they feel really great when I tell them that. And then I tell them I went to Harvard. They, they, if I only tell them I went to Harvard, they think I'm an arrogant jerk. Uh, but if I tell them that I failed first and that I went to Harvard, they think that's really awesome. Uh, they think that's really cool. Um, so I did. Uh, I also grew up in a predominantly working class uh, white suburb of Chicago, uh, which has kind of put me really in tune, I think, to my own culture and having to hear other people describe it, examine it uh, in the not uh, most polite ways uh, directly to me, to my face. Uh, so I'm fairly comfortable talking openly about it at this point and having open and, and frank uh, conversations, no pun intended. Um, so uh, all of this has really come to this issue and I think uh, a lot of first generation scholars uh, who come from working class backgrounds, who are people of color, uh, I, I think a big part of their narrative or the narrative that we share is uh, we are we, what we study. We are the ones uh, that we're talking about. We're the ones that we're thinking about. We see ourselves in our students, uh, that this was a very intentional uh, process for us to wind up teaching students like ourselves. And that's another subtext that I wanna make very explicit in this conversation. Um, so initially, I, I I kind of, I was just a nerdy kid. I was smart, good at school, and people just said, well, you should keep going to school. Uh, I uh, thought maybe I was gonna be a clinical psychologist, and I got a book, it was literally from the American Psychological Association, like how to become a clinical psychologist, and it said you had to get research experience, it said you had to uh, volunteer in the community, and being a good student, I just started, take the GRE, I just started going through the checklist of things that I had to do. One of the most transformative things that I did as an undergrad was take on uh, a, a, a research assistantship, become an undergraduate research assistant in a human development um, psych psychology lab where we were looking at urban youth's exposure to violence, looking at their identity development, looking at how it helped them uh, do well or not do well in school and how it affected uh, their mental health. Um, that was really interesting. It was a, a huge learning experience. The most transformative piece for me of that project, though, uh, were the graduate students that I worked with. Uh, there was an African-American uh, male that, that was on our project. His name was Michael Jordan in Chicago. Not the Michael Jordan. Uh, this is Michael Jordan. Uh, I had another uh, friend, uh, mentor, uh, who was a Chicano guy from LA in Chicago. We don't use the term Chicano. We just call each other Mexican, uh, which is the largest ethnic group, or you're Puerto Rican. Those are, that's the second largest Latino ethnic group. Um, but this was the first time I saw somebody who had some sort of uh, intentional consciousness of what it meant to be what we would today call Latinx, Chicano, Latino, who thought about it. Um, and these were two males of color that were highly educated. They were on this path that I thought, I should be on this path because I'm a smart guy, right? Um, so I ended up getting on that path. And as you heard, I went to, uh, to various graduate schools and, and a, a, lot, a lot of it was peripatetic. It was not this direct uh, path and uh, it, it completely intentional at the time. In retrospect, I think I became aware that uh, I was doing it maybe uh, subconsciously, intentionally. Um, but uh, the study of psychology, I think, was just studying myself is, is kind of what I'm saying here. So the intersection of culture and psychology. So I think already I'm kind of highlighting how this happened. I'm a cultural minority. I'm growing up in a, culture, in a context where I truly am a cultural minority in Chicago, which is famously segregated. Uh, and when I talk to my students today, uh, they will say, uh, you know, that, uh, that Northeastern uh, is uh, the first time that they are aware that they were Latino, for example, and I'll get to that. Uh, because they grow up in largely segregated neighborhoods where they might be at high schools uh, where 100% of the people are Latino, Latinx, where the entire neighborhood is predominantly immigrant. Um, I have always been kind of a, a min true minority and an outsider, so this is something I've thought a lot about since I was very, very young. And it was here in New York City that I, I actually, my two mentors, 
uh, were Carola Suarez Orozco, who's a self-described cultural psychologist. She's now at UCLA. And her husband, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, who is an anthropologist. He's now the dean of UCLA's uh, Graduate School of Education and Information Sciences. So they're a couple. They're married. And um, it's no surprise that uh, they're together because they both are interested in this intersection of how culture and society creates individuals, but how, so, how individuals create society. So I wanted to kind of give you all, as you know, a, a leaping off point, this idea of what this cultural psychology is, because it's really not like a widespread field. You won't find a lot of departments that have anyone that identifies themselves as a cultural psychologist. You won't find uh, a lot of academics who, uh, who subscribe to this particular theory or strain of psychology. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, the, the, I would argue that you know psychology in many ways has become much more biological, uh, much more cognitive, actually uh, not thinking as much about the larger context. Uh, but I'm, I'm open to uh, other ideas about that. Um, if you were at my lunch, uh, I said that uh, students uh, once told me very early on in my uh, assistant professorship uh, not to use PowerPoints. Uh, they were literally falling asleep, and they told me not to do this. So if I start to make you fall asleep, tell me to stop. Uh, but I'm going to read a few. Uh, but for the most part, I'll ad lib, and uh, I'm going to be really funny. It's going to be great. <laughs> Cultural psychology is a study of the way cultural traditions and social practices regulate, express, and transform the human psyche, right? Uh, culture uh, creates us as individuals. The way subject and object, self and other, psyche and culture, culture person and context, figure and ground, practitioner and pra practitioner practice live together, require each other, and dynamically, dialectically, and jointly make each other up. They're mutually constitutive, right? It's not just culture that creates you and makes you who you are. It doesn't essentialize you and you just become Latino because you were born into a Latino family, or I just become Mexican because I was born into a Mexican family. I also have the intention of creating myself as a Mexican individual, or a Mexican American, or a Chicano, or a Latinx scholar, right? Uh, I have the capacity to do these things. There's intentionality, there's freedom, there's, uh, to not to sound too grandiose, but there's kind of a liberatory aspect to it. Um, and I think as I say this to frame my conversation, I think it really will help us to think through what it means to be a Hispanic serving institution because it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be something static that's predefined that other people impose or that we have to kind of mark some categories, even though the categories are few, which we, we mark and, and they, it's actually pretty ill-defined. But in that, I see an enormous opportunity. And so I'll describe for you some of the opportunities that I've taken to help Northeastern think about what it means to be a Hispanic serving institution. Okay. Again, it just presumes that people respond. They, rep they represent things. Things are represented to them. It makes up who they are. And that the worlds that are around us are artifactual worlds that we've created. Right? We design them. We're the music makers. So when I started here in New York City working on my dissertation, I decided for myself that I really wanted to stu study something. Uh, I didn't want to work on somebody else's project. I didn't want to um, uh, you know, focus on somebody else's research. I really wanted to focus on what I wanted to focus on, which was me, Mexican immigrant kids. Mexican immigrant kids in New York City in the mid-2000s, uh, actually the mid-90s, there was this huge migration from Puebla, uh, Mexico, uh, from the Mixteca region. And now it's amazing to me, because as I walk the streets, 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, like about every block, there's like a Mexican taqueria, there's a Mexican restaurant. And even 12 years ago, that just was non-existent. Um, and so it's really come to fruition that there's a large, significant, and very visible Mexican population here. It was in, of interest to me because I had arrived from Boston where there's virt there were virtually no Mexican immigrants. Uh, and I'd come from Chicago, and that was a big part of my identity. And a big part of my identity was also being the only one being the only one who went to college, being the only one who had a bachelor's degree, being the only one who went to graduate school, so on and so forth. And so what I was really interested in is what were the procedures, what was this cultural psychology, what was the culture and the context around constituting why individuals didn't go to college? And one of the colloquial things that I heard young people say was, Mexicans don't go to college. And it was accepted as truth. It was put out there as a fact. That's who we are. We just 
That's, that's our culture. Our culture doesn't care about education. To me, that was also a little bit antiquated. It seemed a little bit behind the times because while Chicago was a little bit progressed beyond, I think, New York, it has an older Mexican immigrant population that dates back to the 1920s. And even beyond that was my Chicano friend who has a Mexican immigrant population in Los Angeles that dates back to when the border crossed them and they didn't cross the border, right? Um, there was just this consciousness, these different levels of consciousness about what it meant. So it was really curious to me to be able to see in action how young people's identities were being created within the context of a Latinx environment where you have large Latinx groups like Colombians and Puerto Ricans, but where they're not the dominant group, they're kind of a newly arrived immigrant population. And what does that mean for their own individual identity? Okay. So I want to know about their college knowledge. So all that uh, theoretical gobbledygook uh, translates into, I talked to 107 Mexican adolescents, self-described, self-identified students of Mexican immigrant background here in New York. I traipsed across all five boroughs on public transportation. Uh, I went to community organizations. I didn't get my IRB approved by the New York City Public Schools, which is still a sore spot for me because they said my research was not educational research, even though I was studying uh, education. They said, this is something different. I wasn't studying testing, is, is what it amounted to. So I, I, I spoke to 107 first and second generation Mexican youth from Mexican immigrant families. Uh, and I asked them about their social networks. The reason I asked them about their social networks is because uh, as a cultural psychologist, the idea is that your social network constitutes part of who you are. Your culture constitutes who you are. And uh, also being trained as a very positivistic psychologist, I was trying to find a way to quantify culture. If I have a lot of Latino people around me, maybe I'll be more Latino, right? Um, which is basically what the theory amounted to. And part of this was the strictures of my program that imposed that upon me. Uh, but it, you know, it yielded some interesting results. So I asked students to name everybody in their social network, everybody that was important to them. They had network sizes ranging from one to 20. Uh, and then I categorized them by whether these were family members, whether these were non-relative adults like teachers, counselors, coaches, and whether these were friends. So obviously 95% named family members, 57% uh, named a peer, and 25% named uh, a non-relative adult in their social network that was important to them. So this is really important. These are adolescents. This is actually atypical when you look at the adolescent research literature, because the largest group would be, who, who knows what the largest group would be if you're an adolescent? It would be your friends. It would be your friends that most students would name their peers. So this was particular to the, this particular uh, group of Mexican uh, immigrant students. And then I wanted to know specifically what kind of information was provided by these people of these different groups. Um, and so I looked at the educational background of the, the parents and the social network. The mothers, only 18%, less than one in five had completed 12 years of schooling, and only about one of 10 fathers had completed 12 years of schooling. At the time, the mean was about eight years for Mexican immigrants in New York City. In the New York City, uh, I forget which department, but they put together a report that said the average years of education was about eight for adults of Mexican descent. And then in terms of the home language, uh, it's actually a really nice bell curve. Uh, with the uh, plurality saying that they sp spoke both equally, but I could tell you uh, this is not accurate uh, because when I spoke to them, uh, most of them I spoke in Spanish because they were not functionally able to communicate in English, but they believed they were fluent and they said they believed their families were fluent and their families believed they were fluent. Um, but if you uh, looked at some objective measures or even their practice, they were mostly Spanish dominant. So this is a little bit of a misrepresentation or inaccurate representation. And then when you looked at the social networks in terms of their ethnicity, uh, they were almost exclusively Latinx. Half of them had only other Mexican people that they named in their social network, and 29% uh, said only Latinos, so that gives like a grand total of about 80% that had only Latinx people in their social network, the important people to them. I'm gonna speed up a little bit so you can kind of get the picture. Um, who had a college educated member? 65, two thirds had nobody in their social network that had a college education. 
And then when you look at academic support, this was a little bit more hopeful. Do you have anybody in your family that provides college info? 77% or anybody in your network that provides college info, almost 78% said yes. Great, this has actually made me a little bit more hopeful. But then when you looked at it and you asked who provides you with this information, it was their family. Well, now there's something, there should be some dissonance here that happens. Why is that a problem? Their family provides them information about college, but their family has on average about eight years of education. Okay? Most of the information about college were things like, si se puede, yes you can. Echele ganas, work really hard, apply yourself. Or something more violent, probably, like I'm gonna kill you if you don't go to college, things like that. A little more authoritarian. And this pattern held true for along uh, several different dimensions, like who uh, provides academic support, help studying for exam. Again, it was family. Um, who provides homework help, getting more concrete. Again, family. So families have low levels of education, low access to academic resources, and they don't provide uh, instrumental academic support, but they provide a lot of encouragement. Students reported knowing friends and mentors who provided support, and of the friends that provided support, sometimes they were younger friends or younger siblings that were, they would say, oh, uh, you're 14, where do you go for math help? I go to my 12-year-old sister because she's really good at math. You're 16, where do you go for English help? I go to my 13-year-old brother because he speaks English better than me. Uh, and there were numerous instances of, of things like this happening. And there were the most rare instance, though, was I have this one teacher who really cares about me. I have this one teacher, uh, I'll tell you uh, a very specific story, a young woman who said, the teacher told me I should take his AP psychology class. And I said, I'm terrible, I don't care about psychology, I'm not interested in psychology. And so uh, I said, no, I, I really want you to take it, I'll tutor you, I'll help you out. She took it, she got an A, she earned an A. And then he said, now you're gonna take my AP math class. And she said, I'm not gonna take it. I'm, and he said, I'll tutor you this summer, uh, I have tutoring sessions after school, uh, you can do it. So she, he tutored her, got her ready before the math class, she took the AP calculus class, passed it, got a five and then she got a full scholarship to Brooklyn College. Um, but that was extremely rare, extremely rare that somebody would connect with a student in that way and put forth that kind of effort. And in actuality, it seemed that it was that kind of effort that was needed in order to truly help a student navigate higher education, okay? Um, and then we don't even know whether, what kind of support these students were accessing when they were accessing support from uh, peers, you know, these were the only the explicit instances. There were some students that weren't as explicit. We don't know. So now I graduate, I walk across stage, I get my PhD, I'm so smart and accomplished. And then I find uh, these three positions in Chicago. Uh, one was for working with Latino, uh, the Latino Studies program and the social work program at Northeastern Illinois University, which even though I'm from Chicago, I'd never heard of this institution. I, I have no idea. It has 9,000 students. It's roughly the same size as John Jay. It's a master's granting institution. It's been around. Um, Depends on who you ask. We're trying to recast our identity and say that we were founded in uh, 1871, but in, in actuality we were founded in 1961. Uh, but that's a different uh, story. Uh, we could, if you want to ask about that in the QA, Q and A, we could talk about it. Um, we're an urban institution that was founded in the mid 60s, according to me. And um, I went to visit the campus, and I thought, this is great. This is the greatest thing ever because it's like walking around with John Jay. It's like, it's, it's like a slice of New York. Here I was, and now I've become critical of Chicago because Chicago's segregated and Chicago doesn't offer opportunities for mobility. And then here it was, education provides opportunities for mobility. And I'd been studying students that can't get into college, and here was a place like, they're all in college. They're already here. There's this famous, uh, I forget the name of the bank robber, but the bank robber's name, uh, it eludes me, but his saying was, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> why would I want to work at a Hispanic servant institution? Because that's where the Latinos are, right? I had another job offer in Chicago, in my hometown, at a very elite institution, 
and I was told, you're our Latino. You're going to be our Latino. So I said, no, I won't. Because, according to my research, our students do not have social connections with people that can provide them access to navigate higher ed. What good would it be for me to be in Hyde Park in Chicago helping students who've had elite educations throughout? Uh, so intentional lesson number one is I intentionally chose, and this isn't to be grandiose or you know, to pat myself on the back, a little. Uh, I said I want to work at uh, the Hispanic Serving Institution, even though I, I really have no idea what this place is that I'm getting into. Um, much to the chagrin of my very liberal and progressive uh, advisors. Oh, we didn't even get a job at the University of Chicago. Well, there are a lot of Latinos in Chicago, and, and I told the group earlier, maybe I had this complex, and maybe it was a bit of a messiah complex. Maybe I thought I was going to save all these Latinos. I was going to be like the catcher in the rye, catching people off the cliff, right? Um, there are a lot of Latinos in Chicago. That's what this slide says. <laughs> A lot of Latinos in Chicago have very low levels of education, is what this slide says. But Latinos are not only the future, they're the now. These are the students we have. You can't replace them. You can't get different students. You're not going to go out to the suburbs and find them. As a matter of fact, the fact that there are Mexicans here in New York who are no longer only in New York, they were in New Jersey, they're no longer only in New Jersey, they're in central Pennsylvania. They're not only in central Pennsylvania, they are now in Ohio. And in Chicago, they were already in Chicago and they were already in Gary, Indiana. They're gonna meet up and then they're gonna connect with the ones from California and Denver and Kansas City and then the reconquest will be complete. <laughs> <laughs> this is the population of students that we have, right? This is the population of students. Don't tell Jeff Sessions. Um, don't tell him at all. OK? This is the population that we have. There is not an opportunity to swap them out. There is not a way to gentrify a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. So, and this is the larger view. That, that was the Illinois view. 20% of 18 to 24-year-olds are Latino. High school graduation, uh, even though Latinos are last amongst these major ethnic groups, racial groups, um, and, and again, uh, we could get in these long philosophical conversations about what a Latino is. Latino is not a racial group. Uh, I hope I don't have to explain that to you all, but maybe I do, so I'm going to say it just in case. Latino is not a racial group. It's not a country of origin group. There are black Latinos and white Latinos and redhead Latinos, and there are English-speaking Latinos and non-English-speaking Latinos. There are non-Spanish-speaking Latinos and non-Spanish-English-speaking Latinos. They speak Mixteco or uh, Guarani. So they come in all varieties, but I just want to make this clear. But we, they, they do, as my philosopher friend at NEIU says, but they still constitute some subjective reality that you could see. And that reality, sadly, follows these socially constructed trends about education and stuff like that. This looks bad, but it's good, because when I started studying this, the number was around 50%. When I was an undergrad and when I first started caring about this in a conscious way, the number, the graduation rate was around 50%. So this is an enormous improvement. And the group is growing exponentially. So you have more graduates in a larger group. And this, this is what this says. The number's gone up hugely. And what this says is not only are they graduating and completing high school, they're going to college, they're going to John Jay, they're going to Northeastern, they're going to Brooklyn College, they're going to Lehman College. The public health campaign, and it was an intentional public health campaign to say, the path upward for you, immigrant family, is education. It is the path upward. Message was received, loud and clear. And if it's not clear here in the data, I don't know what I could do to convince you. The message has been clearly received. The path for Latinos, part of this is through education, path upward. Part of this is to dispel the Jeff Sessions, uh, to dispel um, the uh, Sam Huntington, 
the the uh, the Hispanic uh, condition. I think I forget the name of the article, um, but he basically said Hispanics, Latinos are going to be a huge drain on the U.S. They're going to pull down the mean enormously in terms of educational levels, socioeconomics. But the message has been received. Latinos are stepping up to the plate. They're going to college. As a matter of fact, they're doing so more than any other group. They have the highest college enrollment rates out of high school amongst any group other than Asians as of 2012. They are going to college. This brings me to my life at Northeastern. Because my life at Northeastern became, I became a bit disillusioned after about a year. After getting my, uh, you know, my 10 year sea legs under me and learning how to actually teach and learning how to manage department meetings and politics in about second or third year, I thought, Northeastern sucks. <laughs> we are really bad at helping students. We are really bad. Here's the context. What's, so let's take a little pause for a second. What's a Hispanic serving institution? So this federal designation, and I remember you say, I saying, oh, how do you be intentional about it? Well, you really don't because there's only two criteria. The only criteria are 25% Latinx students and 50% low income. That's it. You're a Hispanic serving institution. Ta-da! That's all it takes. Nonetheless, there are 370 colleges and universities in this category. It's about 11% of all universities, and there are more uh, every year that, that fall into this category. 59% of all Latinx students in college in all of the United States go to just those 11% of institutions. Okay? So, why? Why? Well, HSI has also graduated a lot of Latinos because a lot of Latinos go there. But not necessarily because they serve them well, because the operative word in Hispanic serving institution is that you are serving students. And the joke is, and I'm sure Gina Garcia used it, they're Hispanic enrolling institutions. We enroll a lot of Latino students, but are we truly serving Latino students? Okay? Unlike HBCUs, HSIs are not intentional. These intentional worlds, these are not constituted things that somebody thought up. Before the fact, there was not some grand plan put together to create an HSI. We are only now, after the train has left the station, are we creating the train and saying, oh, by the way, we should have thought a little more carefully other than those two criteria about what an HSI should be. Okay? Unlike HBCUs, tribal colleges, they do not have a culturally explicit, explicit mission. They're ad hoc. Students choose HSIs, why? They're affordable, they're close to home, and they have more open admissions, they're easy to get into. That's why they choose them, okay? It hurts a little bit, but it's true, it's just the reality, uh, that's why we choose them. At Northeastern, 35% of undergraduates are Latino, Latinx. Latino student retention was 53% for the first year students entering in 2015. 55% uh, for the entire freshman cohort. We tracked each other reasonably well at that point. Uh, the Latino six-year graduation rate was 21% for freshmen entering in 2012, 2010, and about 24%. So that's a six-year graduation rate. When faced with this, I started to realize we're doing something that uh, is less than chance. Uh, chance is, I, I love statistics, chance is 50-50. You have 50-50 odds. So just, uh, uh, prima facie, just looking on the surface here, you would say, well, something intentional or unintentional is, is going wrong here. Okay? Why would a Hispanic servant institution serve students so po poorly? This is the question that really uh, plagued me after my second or third year. So there was a study, this is a larger scale study of a few thousand students, uh, 6,900 to be exact, nationwide not just Latino students, that looked at why these students enroll at Hispanic serving institutions. And by and large, regardless of ethnicity, they were first generation college students, they were low income, they had lower standardized math scores, they ranked living near home important in their college choice, they were non-native English speakers, this does not mean they were Spanish speakers, they could have spoke Korean or Bosnian or Czech. They came from high minority high schools, 
and they had schools with high minority staffing. So these aren't excuses, these are just the d demographic statistical realities of the probabilities of uh, taking a profile of a particular student. This could have been true even if you were an African American student, which could actually fit probably seven of those eight categories, right? As a matter of fact, uh, not pe many people know this, HSIs gra uh, graduate more African Americans than any other type of institution, even HBCUs. Uh, more African Americans graduate from HSIs. So, um, we had these programs in place at Northeastern that were fought, uh, brought through struggle, and they existed on our campus. And I thought, well, these programs were really great. And, but I did start to think, well, why aren't these programs working, right? I mean, it, or are they working, or why aren't all Latinos doing well? We had this program that I helped teach in called our Summer Transition Program, which was our Summer Bridge Program. Um, our Summer Bridge Program consisted of a six-week uh, summer session, um, and it was for about 120 students. We typically admit a freshman class of about 800 to 1,000. Um, so this is only a small percentage of those students. And the kind of cornerstone of the class, or cornerstone of the summer, is a free class that they get, a free content class. This particular class they asked me to teach. I taught it for four summers. It was a Latino studies class. Um, and uh, this has award-winning program. In addition, they had college uh, math coaching and college uh, English coaching. And my assignments were kind of in tandem with the English coaches, so that way I would give like a six page essay over the course of the summer, and the writing coach would, who was actually an instructor, but only they didn't give credit for the course, uh, would walk them through the process and help them specifically with the specifics of my assignment, right? So they were being coached specifically on that. Um, the results were, were excellent. We also have, on Northeastern, uh, something that was born of struggle, a campus called El Centro, uh, El Centro de Recursos Educativas, uh, Educativos, um, and this was um, the Center for Educational Resources. It was started in the 60s at a time when the Hispanic population at Northeastern was only 5%. And so they said, we need to have more Latino students at Northeastern. And so what they did was uh, they went out to the community and said, enroll in college. And they realized, well, uh, they weren't ready for college. They said, okay, enroll in GED. So then they started doing GED programs out of a church. And then they realized, but the GED programs were in Spanish, so they didn't speak English, and they had to teach them to speak English. So over several years, they had to kind of build the capacity of students before the mid-1970s when they actually had a permanent home where they actually offered four-credit college courses. So it took about 10 years to get that point, 1965 to 1975. And then um, about five years ago, they built a brand new campus, and I'll tell you a little bit of a story around that in a minute. But the brand new campus uh, was a building because we lost our lease where we were before and they invested in this campus. Um, it also has some of the highest uh, retention rates on our campus when you look at this subgroup. So the summer transition program has high retention rates and El Centro has high retention rates. It also at this point offers full majors. So you can only attend this campus which is in the Latino community that offers full majors. Social work, computer science, justice studies, and um, special education. Then we have another program that was started around the same time in the 60s called Proyecto Palante, which uh, is kind of a, a Puerto Ricanism, um, which is Proyecto Para Adelante, Project Getting Ahead. Um, and uh, started in the mid-70s, and it's bilingual bicultural support, intrusive advising, there's a cultural seminar, College 101, that all students take. Um, and uh, it's highly successful, okay. So all of these are very Latino-centric programs. So I wanted to know like, okay, well, these programs seem to be successful. Um, what's going on at Northeastern more largely? And so we engaged in a participatory action research project that looked at ethnic identity. The reason we looked at ethnic identity was because of this issue uh, this was just one component amongst many that we looked at, was thinking, well, we have a lot of Latino students. Why do we, they need to know about their identity? They're already Latino. Why should you teach somebody who's already something? Like, if I'm an English speaker, why should I take English, right? I mean, why should I learn about Shakespeare if I already speak English? 
I'm being facetious and sarcastic. <laughs> okay? Um, well, there's a lot of research that shows when you study your own culture and your own identity, you do better. Um, stronger academic motivation, allows you to access resources from your culture, um, and it affects your GPA very concretely. Okay, I'm gonna skip over some of this. So engage in an action research project to explore this. And within the context of a class, it evolved over several semesters with different groups of students, but I kind of picked groups from uh, different classes and it culminated in actually doing a research project where we surveyed Latino freshmen on campus and asking them about their experience along a lot of different dimensions. And one of those was uh, ethnic identity. Um, and we went through the IRB, we, you know, we uh, had all these surveys and stuff like that. So when students identified who they were, a lot of them identified primarily with their ethnic, their national origin. Uh, some of them used a pan-ethnic, the next largest pan-ethnic being Latino, Latina, Hispanic, so grouping a lot of smaller groups together. Uh, next was hyphenated American, like I'm Mexican-American, Puerto Rican-American. Uh, no students said American, and some students said other, right? There's a, a measure out of Cal State Los Angeles uh, that a psychologist named Gene Finney has put together that looks at ethnic identity, and it asks about intentionality around ethnic identity. And uh, what it, students said on the surface quantitatively was that they strongly agreed that they, or agreed, that they actively pursue their identity, okay? But being a cultural psychologist, you have to look at these things more carefully. So we ask them, well, what do you do? We ask qualitative interviews. And these are the kind of sad but telling things that they said. I'm Guatemalan, I go on the internet, watch YouTube videos about the marimba. That's what makes me Guatemalan. I've never been to Guatemala, so I can't say a lot about it. I know Latino cultures, you know, listen to their music, eating their food. That's who we are. Speaking Spanglish is what makes me Mexican. The food that I eat, I put salsa valentina on everything. It's okay to laugh. I'm not like other Mexicans making all that noise, super prideful. Uh, they don't know about their background. I'm not like them. Okay. Now, I was teaching Latino studies classes, and I took some of this data back to the students. And I'm gonna connect all these things in a moment uh, with these other success programs. Because I think all of these other programs, the El Centro, the Proyecto Palante, there was still this outstanding question of what was the secret sauce other than just translating everything into Spanish, or than just having a few brown faces. I think there was actually more to it than that. And I think this is what I'm trying to get at and the argument I'm trying to make here. So Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is a Brazilian educator, a philosopher, Paulo Freire, uh, and he called it conscientização, which means consciousnessation, conscious, consciousness raising, um, and raising people's consciousness about their social position. Uh, the way he did it was going out to rural areas of Brazil and simply teaching people how to read, how to decipher texts. And then he taught them how to decipher society and how to think about culture and how to, about to think about their social position. And so part of what uh, we were engaged in here was helping students decipher what it means to be a Hispanic servant institution, or more specifically, what it means to be Latino, which is something that they really hadn't had to confront before because other things they had said to me was, I never realized I was Latino until I came to Northeastern because I'd always been only around other Latinos. Uh, the, the analogy that's made in terms of the study of culture is, how would you ask a fish what the water is like? Right? What water? What's the air like between us? What air? Right? It's just so ubiquitous. It's so taken for granted. It's common sense that uh, our students didn't think about it until they were presented with this data and they said, wait, wait a second. Uh, I'm becoming conscious of myself as a racial being. And there's another model of racial identity development that goes through these stages of what's called conformity. And the first stage would be, well, I just kind of take for granted that the way the world works is the way the world works. It is not an intentional world. It is just a real world, and what exists, exists. Black kids get shot. Um, Mexicans, the kids don't go to college. And that's just the way it is. That's what we are. 
but at some point there might be some dissonance where the good black kid gets shot or the smart Mexican kid fails out of college. And then somebody says, wait a second, that wasn't supposed to happen. Then there's resistance and say, actually, pardon me, that's a little fucked up that that happened. I don't like it. And then you think about it, and it's hopefully at some point you develop an integrative awareness about this, and you say, yes, it's fucked up that this happened. No, it does not have to be this way. Can we create something different? Can we think about how this got to be the way it is, and how can we fix it? So within the context of a class, I would give students readings in a social work and immigration class, social work and Latinos class, and social work and immigration class, and I would ask them to respond to the readings via um, a online discussion board, uh, the, the course platform, which was Blackboard at the time. And these are students' responses, which actually developed into quite sophisticated analyses and critical analyses of their social situation. Sometimes they were at the conformity stage. Um, so they were talking about the language, and this young person said, my mother learned English while working in a nursing home with people who only speak English to her. She had to learn to communicate with the residents in the nursing home, and I could speak with some confidence because she followed up in class and say, said, that's the way it should be. Immigrants should come here and learn to speak English. They need to forget their language, suck it up, pull themselves up by the bootstraps, and learn the language. Conformity. Dissonance. This is all a student's words, a different student. But there are some lived experiences that only someone who is stereotyped as Latina or someone who calls herself Latina would understand. And remembering moments of racism or rude comments that darker skinned Latinos may have experienced, such as, are you from the US? Oh, wow, you got rid of your accent. You have brown eyes and skin and you're Latina? Wow. And these are these moments of dissonance where you say, but I was a good Latino and they're treating me like crap. So then resistance and immersion, and you could even see this young woman has politicized terms in the way she describes herself. She's a Chicana with an X, a Tejana, a very uh, politicized identity who says she's sensitive to these issues and at the end basically says, this is why I'm uncompromising. I don't want to be a part of this, I resist. And she was in that stage, at least this comment was. Another student, all of these are separate students. All of these readings had a meaningful connection to how Latinos have developed. Uh, I perceive that times are still not where they should have been, and it's shocking how Latinos are segregated from the majority in education, economically, and even socially. Uh, I always felt that Latinos were a big part of the United States, however, we're not. We're actually only 17%. I do this funny exercise at the be beginning. What percentage of Latinos in the U.S. are, or what percentage of the U.S. are Latinos? 90%. 85%. And we could ask some people in Wisconsin, and they might say the same thing, or be afraid of the same thing. 17, it's 18% today, not even one in five. This was integrative awareness. And when you actually look at these numbers, we see that our students that were in these programs that had a very intentional cultural focus outperformed students who were also Latinx that did not have a cultural focus. This is Proyecto Palante. This is Proyecto Palante and the summer transition program, which had a cultural focus. You see a huge difference between those who were retained in the first year and those who were not retained. You see a huge difference in terms of GPA and credits earned. In El Centro, you see an enormous difference between retention rates, 83% versus 60% for the entire student body. 70%, and that was in 2013, 70% versus 60% in 2014. These are massive differences, right? Um, correlation's not causality, but the proof is in the pudding. Students focused on superficial culture, they didn't pursue their knowledge about their culture, but to me, what all of this tells me is this is a missed opportunity especially for the negative connotations associated with those bad blank, whatever they are. HSIs, in my opinion, should be a cultural space where the intersection between academics and culture are clear, where they're intentional. This, if you want to call it therapy, or you know, what some people would say, oh, this is liberal mongering of indoctrination or whatever, 
these students graduated. Some of my students went to the University of Chicago, St. Louis University for their law degree, University of Michigan. Uh, many of these students went on to get graduate degrees in different disciplines like social work, sociology. HBCUs are a model for this. The largest producer of black physicians come from HBCUs. My contention is that HSIs need to be intentional about these things, uh, thoughtful about them. Ensure that we are setting it up so that way the success happens. Ensure that the peers that students are most likely to go to are not just lead the blind leading the blind, but they're adequately prepared to help them. Make sure the professors and college staff are aware that they are the last and possibly the only line of academic support in life of a student, and therefore must be culturally responsive and respectful of those students' cultures. Um, I would love to show you this, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to jump to the final slide, which is a cautionary tale. All of these programs that I've mentioned have been systematically dismantled at Northeastern Illinois University. The summer transition program was discontinued because it was too expensive. Um, the Proyecto Balanta staff was cut from five to three. And there was an attempt when I told you that they moved the lease from one uh, site to another for El Centro, where they said, and remember, El Centro people, this is not only for Latinos. Remember, this is for all students. Well, all students at Northeastern are 35% of the students, and all freshmen at Northeastern are 53% of the students. Then they built residence halls. And they heavily recruited in Wisconsin, and they heavily recruited in Iowa, and they heavily recruited in Indiana. And 80% of those students come from Chicago public schools and are students of color. And now they're deeply in debt because they were sold something that uh, they were hoping would gentrify our university. Someone, they, who's the they? I, am I a conspiracy theorist? Maybe. But again, uh, I've, I'm pointing to numbers because our retention rate plummeted. Correlation is not causality. All of this happened within the past five years, these, this systematic dismantling this past year. The reason I have become the provost fellow for success and retention this year is because I've been um, ringing the bell. I've been saying, there's a fire. We're dismantling things the retention rate's gonna go down. And finally, uh, an interim provost stepped in and said, I think maybe we need to do something. Well, we were doing it, but we undid it. So there's a bit of a cautionary tale here um, uh, to think through uh, and listen to the students and, and listen to what's already working. The other piece I'll tell you about the Proyecto Palante, about El Centro, about summer transition program, they were not scaled up. They only served about 80 to 100 students each in a campus of 9,000. And so then people said, oh, you see, Latino students are doing well here, so we just have to dismantle these programs. As opposed to saying, no, these are the exact programs that were helping them, and these were the ones that maybe we needed to scale up that the majority of our student body reflects the same students that are in those programs, and if we scale them up, then we would actually generate revenue through tuition dollars. There's an economic argument, a very logical, rational economic argument to be made. Retention means tuition dollars. So that's the cautionary tale. Um, I'll stop there, sorry for not leaving a whole lot of time for questions. I'm happy to take questions uh, and stay, stay behind. But uh, thank you all very much. Yes. What, oh, thank you. What were the students' uh, responses when things were starting to kind of dismantle? Well, this is interesting, and this is unfortunate. Uh, we're largely a commuter campus, and in some ways the students weren't fully aware uh, that these things were being dismantled, because there's a perfect storm here. Our retention rates overall are low. So there's a revolving door of students. 
Now our freshman population only constitutes about 11% of our whole student body. That makes them actually a cash cow, but makes them a little bit expendable because 20% of 11, or 50% of 11%, now you're only talking about 5% of the student body that actually remains, that is aware that they're being disenfranchised, that is aware that the services that may have served them well are not there anymore. And these are students who have to leave campus immediately after class. These are students who have kids that they have to take care of, who have jobs that they have to go to, who have parents that they have to translate for because of their health issues, chronic health issues. While they love Northeastern, they just don't have it enough psychic energy, let's call it, to say, yeah, I know you all did some struggling in the 60s. I got, I got bills to pay. Thank Does you. I guess I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure if it's a question, yeah. a comment. Um, I, I, uh, we, we have a very diverse population here, and I feel like some of the categories, and, and you spoke to this somewhat at lunch, some of the categories are, are kind of complicated categories. What is a Latino? You know, what is black, right? What are these kind of categories? And really, what these categories are, it seems to me, are reflections of a white supremacist ideology, right? And that, that have created this non-white category, and, or categories, and that, um, that, to teach about that culture, right, uh -huh. as a as a kinds of means of the same kind of uh, enlightenment or consciousness raising, right, as opposed to trying to focus on one individual, uh, like Latino or Black culture, which can get get us into kind of all kinds of issues, right, yeah. of, of reification, essentialization, um, and to focus about how these categories, this processes. That, that I mean that's that's this is often sort of the the take that I'm pursuing yeah right? and and that um, uh, that sort of that angle of a, of a pedagogical qu raising questions about identity and, and those kinds of things in that sort of I don't want to say a dialectical way or inverse no. way or something yeah. like that yeah uh, no absolutely thank you for for bringing it up um, I'd say yes. Um, there is a question of uh, who's in charge of one's own destiny or who, who's in charge of a group's destiny, uh, who decides what it is legitimate in terms of a curriculum, who decides what leadership should look like. Um, we just went through a very contentious presidential search um, where accusations of a, uh, you know, a bunch of flawed candidates who all happened to be black and brown folks were the finalists. Um, and so, uh, and who, the accusations were that this was, um, you know, uh, you know, a, f a corrupted search that these were not the best people to bring to campus. Uh, those were those were comments that were out in the open. So I share them here out in the open. Uh, but I, I can't even offer interpretation. But I'll you 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 raised the interpretation, right? You said, is this a question of white supremacy? Um, Perhaps, you know, um, I'm not sure what else I would call it. I'm not sure what else uh, we would have to say that is going on, is at play here, right? Um, uh, there was also issues of uh, playing black and brown against each other. We have a, a rising African-American student population. Part of that is a result of uh, budget crises that have happened in the Chicago and Illinois area, where one of our campuses, which is in a highly segregated African-American area of the city, fell upon really difficult financial times. And so we have African-American refugees at our campus. Uh, I refer to them as refugees because they're traveling on public transportation upwards of two and a half to three hours. Some of them decided to live in the residence hall. They decided to live in the residence hall, but now they're deeply in debt, and it's kind of creating this entire cycle um, of them being solidified in a position where they're not going to finish with a bachelor's degree. Um, would I call this some sort of like uh, intentional conspiracy? No, I wouldn't say that there was somebody twisting his or her mustache, uh, her mustache. <laughs> the thought of that's funny, although uh, 
there's not somebody hatching a plot. I, I, I mean, you're, we're in a country that was uh, started uh, on the hands, on the backs of uh, African slaves, black bodies. Uh, we are a country that has taken half of Mexico, that has taken Puerto Rico, that took Cuba and magnanimously liberated it, uh, has taken Guam. We took the Philippines all as part of the Spanish-American War. Um, and so uh, I think what Gina Garcia said was this is colonized land that needs to be somewhat decolonized. Not somewhat, it needs to be decolonized, right? Uh, that there is a right to self-determination, that there is a question of being an equal partner, a voice at the table, uh, that needs to be wrestled with, that needs to be thought about. Um, I thank you for having the opportunity to speak here, because I think that's part of this, uh, is, is to be able to be really explicit about these topics. Yes? My name is Roseanne. Um, so you talked early on that um, the Mexican population that you were interviewing would say Mexicans don't go to college. Mm -hmm. Have you found in your research that that exists among other nationalities? or? You don't know. Um, I, I've I've heard it amongst African American students. I've heard it amongst uh, you know, and, and this actually, to make it concrete um, and applicable here, um, to me this is part of just culturally relevant, culturally responsive pedagogy is seeing the strengths in different groups. Uh, now psychologists call it the, the growth mindset that you're you're not fixed, right? That you're not this essential thing that is a problem but that you're somebody, you're a person that has potential, that you can grow, that you can think. You can think your way out of the situation. You can act your way out of the situation, right? Um, so I, I think it's an adolescent thing. I think it's a uh, first generation college student thing. Um, I had a student, uh, I was explaining to the group, she got into the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Uh, I, she wasn't even my student, but another student referred her to me and she couldn't afford it. And she said, I'm such a terrible student. And I said, you got in. You just can't pay for it. The issue isn't even, but she had already equated the fact that she just couldn't afford to go with her value as an intellectual person, right? Um, and she basically was already like teetering on saying, this is our people. This is our problem. We can't pay for things, right? This self-blame, this like. Um, so it's not just uh, Latinos, it's not just Mexicans, it's, it's a lot of groups. Uh, some of it is socioeconomic, some of it's first generation college student. Um, some of it, uh, at, at our particular campus, you know, one of our uh, uh, biggest groups is the LGBTQ Latinx population, which are very active on campus. And they also intersect with the, uh, I was explaining earlier, with our undocumented student population. Those, those three inter intersect really strongly with each other. But there's this also sense of like, this is the first time I've ever told anybody that I'm gay, Latino, lesbian, Latino, undocumented, all of these things. I mean, the enormous amount of weight, right? Internalization of this negative, uh, intractable identity. It, it, it's, it's astounding, right? Well, I'd like to thank Professor Gaetano. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and let me uh, remind everybody that on May 2nd, um, Professor uh, Flores is coming uh, to discuss her research, um, coming not as far as Chicago, but from NYU. And I hope you'll all be able to join us in L63 next door for that. Thank you. <laughs>